Good morning, Westside. <laughs> Welcome to church. As people are still coming in, I thought it'd be great if we could sing one last Christmas carol before the season ends. Well, we're going to sing some more Christmas songs in the service, but let's just do uh, We Three Kings together, all right? Does that sound good? <clears throat> gift it is? What? We just did frankincense. Myrrh, yes. Awesome. Here we go. <laughs> Verse four or something. I don't know. Myrrh is mine. It's bitter
God is with us, even now His love is here. Come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. God is with us. All right, it's good to be with you today. East, or Easter, it's going to be an Easter day, even though it's Christmas. That'll all make sense later. But I wanted to give you a special Merry Christmas today. I'm glad that you're here, especially if you're a guest with us or if this is your first time with us. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm going to invite now the choir. The choir's going to get up and leave. They're going to go around back and get ready. So if you see a bunch of people leaving right now, that's what they're doing. They're going to get prepared. They're going to sing a great song they've been preparing for us. But it's, it's, it's uh, Christmas season, and every Christmas... Like many of you, we like to do like an Advent wreath experience. Many of you have, made, have these at home. You've seen it where it's a wreath and around it's four different candles and one in the middle. And they typically stand for the candle of peace, hope, joy, and love and the Christ candles in the middle. 
awesome. Every year we like to do it a little bit uniquely, try to tie it with a sermon series. And so this year we've got these four boxes up here. We're opening one each week that represent the gift that one of the three kings brought, or the three magi brought to baby Jesus. The first one we opened was the gift of gold, and it reminds us that Jesus is our king. Even though that was a gift of gold given to baby Jesus, it's a gift that we get, the fact that Jesus is our king and we should obey him. Last week we opened the second gift, the gift of frankincense, which represents that Jesus is a deity. He is a priest that we can go to and prayer that intercedes for us. And so we opened that. And it reminds us that that's a gift that we have. Now today we're going to talk about the gift of myrrh and what that represents. And I'm going to go ahead and open that. This one reminds us that Jesus is our Savior. I'll tell you all about that when we get to the sermon time. But he's a Savior to be accepted. He's a Savior that came and suffered and died for us. And we should uh, lean into that today. We're going to do very, that very thing today. We're going to sing a song now that reminds us that Jesus, even though Christmas time is a time of great joy, and it should be, that joy only comes because of the deep suffering and pain that Jesus went through as our Savior. So this next song is going to talk a lot about that man of sorrows and really let your mind go in that direction to celebrate the fact that we have a Savior who died for us.
Let's pray together. Father, it is so good to be in your house this morning. It is so good to sense your presence as we worship you. Thank you again for coming as a babe to earth and to live here on earth in the flesh. And then as the song has reminded us, not only coming as a babe, but then dying on the cross. What a sacrifice of love that you have given. What a gift that you gave to us through your death that we could have eternal life. I pray that you would be with this service as it continues, that the Spirit of God would be very real to all of us and that our hearts, our minds would be open for what it is that you want to say because I believe you have something for all of us as we are here today. Thank you again, Jesus, for loving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And now let's listen as the choir sings a classic Christmas carol, Joy to the World.
as the choir is leaving, I will invite all the kids, if you're like, was it fifth grade and under, sixth grade and under, come on down here and meet with me. I want to talk to you about Christmas. So come on down here, kids. We want to have some, some time together. They're not always in the service, but they've been in this month. And so we want to check them out and talk to them. Yeah, leave some room here so I can stand. I don't want to step on top of anybody. Yeah, come on down, kids. We want to see how you're doing. Yeah, there they come. All right. It's a, it's a big week if you're a kid, right? Right? Yeah, that, exactly. It's kind of a big deal, right? Everybody looks forward to it for some time. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, just, I'm going to know what you want for Christmas. So anybody willing to tell me what you've asked for for Christmas? This, let, me, let me pop over here. Let's, let me... Give me some room here. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, dear, what do you want for Christmas? A paint kit. A paint kit? Like, are you an artist? You like to do art and crafts and that sort of thing? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Good for you. Yeah. Who else? Yes, sir. Mr. Isaac, what would you like for Christmas? RC car. A RC car? Like, yeah, that you can do out in the, in the driveway and run, run around the living room and stuff? Yeah. Awesome. Do you have any of those already? Yeah. Oh, you, so you want to add to the collection? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Who over here? Yes, dear. Tell me, tell me what you want for Christmas. I want manicure nails. Nails. What is it? Manicure nails. Manicured nails. <laughs> High five. <laughs> Love the girly stuff. Awesome. What's, yes, sir. What would you like? I want you. <laughs> you want me? I thought, thought you were going to say manicured nails. And that's not happening. <laughs> no boys get that. All right. Yes, let me pop, pop back here. Yeah, I see a hand back here. Tell me what you would like for Christmas, dear. A Barbie dream house. A Barbie dream house? Awesome. That's a great thing to ask for. And by the way, you need new teeth. You miss your front two teeth. <laughs> Maybe you'll get some of those. Yes, sir, Hank. Um, I want a Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Switch? Uh-huh. Can't go wrong with a Nintendo Switch. Yeah, what do you got? Candy. Candy? D- does your mom and dad put candy in your stocking or anything? Do you- uh, I don't know. Okay, well, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, what would you like, Miss Riley? A new water bottle. A new water bottle. <laughs> it's kind of low, low level. <laughs> it's like 99 cents. Yeah, good for you. Anybody over here want to tell me what you want? Yeah, yeah, tell me what you want. Curling iron. A curling iron. Love it, love it. Never used one. <laughs> I've never used a, a regular iron. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. Because you're bald. That's all right. Hey, you can't argue with truth. You can't argue with truth, right? All right, Riley, that's perfect. You just, you just gave a truth bomb. That's what they call it, right? I got no hair. Wait, tell you what. Let me give you another truth thing, that Jesus is the Savior and he loves every one of you. Absolutely. Amen? Yeah. That's what Christmas is about. Okay, you want to tell me what you want? Oh, stage fright right there. All right, kids, I want you to know that it's a special week. Enjoy all the fun of like gifts and food and family, that sort of thing. And you'll enjoy that. That's a lot of fun. But make sure you remember that the reason we celebrate is because Jesus is a gift to you. And that's why we talk about these three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's the very first gifts that we're given. Do you know what the best thing you can give to Jesus is your heart, your life, and serve him? Okay, kids? Now, Pastor Kate is going to talk to you more about that. She's back here at this door. Kids, up on your feet right now. Head towards that door with Kayla. And everybody else, would you stand up on your feet? Grab your Bible or Google or your phone and look up Isaiah 53. I'm going to give you about 60 to 90 seconds to read Isaiah chapter 53. It's 12 verses. Then we're going to look together about Jesus as our suffering servant with myrrh.
And in response to the reading of God's words, we are saying these words together. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, God. you can have a seat. All right, we're going to continue today and actually wrap up our, our series on the, the three gifts of Christmas. But before we do that, let me give you a couple things that are upcoming to make sure you're, we're all in the loop, especially next week. Let's talk about Christmas Eve. Next slide. Or next, next slide. So Christmas Eve is next Sunday. And anytime Christmas is on a Sunday or Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, kind of, it's weird because people are doing like traveling and family things and all kinds of stuff is happening Christmas Eve, which is a special day as well. And I, I always kind of think Christmas Eve service should be like in the eve, you know, but you can have it any time. But here's what we're doing next week, just so you're aware and you can be involved. We're having two services, one on Saturday night, one on Sunday night. Saturday night will be at 7 p.m. next Saturday night. Sunday will be at 5 p.m., okay? Identical services, so there won't be a Sunday morning service here next week. They'll all be in the evening. There'll be identical music, that sort of thing. You can register for that. You don't have to register, but it sure helps us to be prepared. Right now, both services are pretty equal, but let us know. And if you've got family and friends, it's a great time for them to come. Now, we call it Christmas Under the Stars. We've done it outside for the past, you know, or we've done it outside in the past, but it's kind the weather, you never know what it's going to be like. So this year, we're doing it actually in the path, and you're going to see, we're going to set up this whole awesome scene. You won't, it's going to be special, okay? Make sure you come to one of those and enjoy that. Invite somebody, Christmas Under the Stars, Christmas Under the Fluorescence, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be a special night together next weekend, okay? Then, the next Sunday, we do this every year. It's kind of an annual tradition on New Year's Eve. We have a brunch service. It'll be Sunday morning, the 31st. We have it in the, in the West Gym. If you just come to church, we'll point you in the right direction. We're having four different omelet bars that day. We're having a pancake bar and bring some food to share. So we're all going to eat you know, food together and celebrate and have a sermon and the, and the message and the music. Everything will be back in the gym, special time. And I'm starting a new series that time. It's kind of an annual thing I'm doing. For five weeks, we're going to talk about Say Yes to Jesus, stories from the OT. Uh, five different Sundays, but I'm going to talk about like seven different stories from the Old Testament are about people who said yes to God or yes to Jesus in, in respect and, uh, and it's really good at the beginning of the new year to think about what God is asking us to do with our life and where he'd like us to go. So those are where we've got upcoming. But before we jump in, let's talk about some famous gifts. Famous gifts, all right? A little fun here. Um, so I was looking, I've known a few of these, but I looked up some special gifts because we're talking about these three gifts that were given to baby Jesus. Perhaps the three greatest, most famous gifts ever, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But did you know back in the day in the 80s, um, Billy Graham had a moment where he got to meet Mikhail Gorbachev. This was, you know, back in the height of, uh, before the Russian uh, Empire fell and all that. And so he brought him a Russian Bible, kind of a famous gift that Billy Graham bought a Bible printed in Russian and handed to Mikhail Gorbachev, pretty special, famous gift. Uh, if you remember this, Obama gave the Queen of England an iPod. Remember that a few years ago when iPods first came out, filled with music? I think Jay-Z, you know, it was on there. I'm not sure if the Queen ever listened to any of that, but she got one of those. Uh, hundreds of years ago, a couple hundred years ago, France gave a very famous gift to the United States. You know what it was? Statue of Liberty. Yeah, that's a gift given to us by, by France. This is an interesting gift. Joe DiMaggio, this is decades ago. You know, Joe DiMaggio, Jolton Joe, and Marilyn Monroe had this whole fling going on, whatever. When she died, he set up with a local florist to give six red roses on her grave three times a week forever. In 1982, his family canceled the contract. It was too much money, I guess. Anyways, that was going on, but he, he did set that up, right? Did you know, presidents give all kinds of, of special gifts. They used to get crazy stuff, they still do, but Congress passed a law a handful of years ago said that a president can only keep a gift given to him by anybody if it's valued at $375 or less. Otherwise, the president has to pay for the difference or give it to the National Archives. So there's been some wild stuff. Theodore Roosevelt got a zebra and a lion from Ethiopia. I'd just like to get that on Christmas morning. George Bush, George W. Bush got a Komodo dragon from Indonesia. He gave that to the Cincinnati Zoo. Obama was also given alligator insurance in case he's ever in Australia and gets eaten by an alligator. He was really given that. Weird thing, right? Uh, presidents get all kinds of stuff. Movies give some great gifts. Clark Griswold, you remember what he got? The Jelly of the Month Club for one year. The gift that keeps on giving, Clark. <laughs> and perhaps the most famous movie gift ever is the Red Ryder BB gun. 
You'll shoot your eye out. All right, you know that. I got a weird gift this week. Came into my office. I still don't know who this is from. It was on the table in my office. I don't know how they got in there. It's locked. They come in there, and I go, you know, when you get a gift, I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool. What, what do we get here? So I open it up. I'm like, what, what's it was in the package? It was in here, and I open this up, and I get a cat figure. <laughs> I don't know what. Is that, oh, it's an ornament. I just realized that's an ornament. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, thank you to whoever that came from. <laughs> Anyways. And, but, oh, but somebody in our congregation got a very special gift yesterday. David Gruber won a very special award, got this great gift from <laughs> the Christmas movie. Anyways, just a little fun there. The three gifts of Christmas, let's talk about those. Let's, let's get going here. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the three probably most, most famous gifts ever. There's songs about it. There's decorations about it. It's just been around forever. And they're so significant. They matter so much. We've spent time here one per week talking about them. And the first one is gold. We have gold here, a little, you know, my little fake coin purse of gold coins here. And then last week we talked about uh, frankincense here. And today we're going to talk about myrrh, okay? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me remind you what they are. So gold speaks of his royalty. He's a king whom we should obey. Frankincense speaks of his righteousness. He's a priest who goes to us on God's behalf, or or, um, our behalf to God and mediates for us, and we should trust him. And myrrh today speaks of his redemption. He's our savior who's come to save us. Let's talk a little bit about myrrh, okay? So I got myrrh here. As a matter of fact, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to light some incense here, okay? I'm going to try this. We're going to light a couple of these around. So I want you to smell it. Let me get this going here. And it'll kind of waft through the building. It's kind of like frankincense in that it's a, in that it's it's gonna it's just gonna smell for a while here for all of us. It'll be awesome. And uh, it's used historically as an incense, and it'll, you'll see it smell throughout the building here. You'll get the sense of the smell of it. It's a famous thing, and it represents Jesus being our suffering servant and the Lamb of God who was born to die for the forgiveness of our sins, okay? It's an aromatic resin, okay, as you'll, as you'll begin to smell. And today, in today's culture, it's used both for its aromatic and its health properties. Lots of ways, right? We know more about it than they did at Jesus' time. It's used in, for its scent, it's used in perfumes, essential oils, incense, candles. It smells pretty, it smells nice as you'll, as you'll begin to smell it just a little bit. It's also have lots of health benefits, although some people say none of it is scientifically approved. Some people say it is. I don't know. Um, It's used for back pain, diarrhea, parasitic infections, wound healing, indigestion, ulcers, colds, coughs, asthma, respiratory congestion, arthritis, and cancer. Like everything. They use it for everything. It's one of those miracle drugs that people say, just rub a little of this on. It'll probably cure. We'll figure it out. I'm not sure if it does all those things, but people use it for lots of things. It also has oral health properties. People use it as mouthwash and Toothpaste. It's, it's all over. Uh, the, it's used in many ways. The word um, myrrh means bitter. It means bitter, okay? This is where the word, the name Mara comes from. If you remember the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, her mother in law, Naomi, is so bitter at God, she changes her name to Mara. She says, because I'm bitter at God. It's also where we get the name Myron or Myra, or Mira, they all come from that root. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, there's a mountain, Mount Moriah, okay? It also comes from the same root word. Mur comes from the root mor. This is where Abraham was tested to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, okay? It's all connected together to this bitter and sacrifice and suffering. In the Bible, it's used 17 times. It comes up 17 different times. 14 of them are in the Old Testament, Three are in the New Testament. The word myrrh comes up. Joseph's brothers, for example, you know that story where they're so tired of their younger brother and he's the favorite, he gets the coat of many colors and they love him and they, they're out in the desert and they see this caravan of people come by and they sell him into slavery. You know what they trade him for? A bunch of commodities including myrrh. Myrrh was a commodity in the day and so they traded Joseph for some of that including some other things. In the book of Revelation, it talks about a city called Smyrna. It means the city of myrrh, a bitter city that it had hard times. The city of Smyrna. There are five main uses of myrrh in the Bible. And this is going to help you understand why we talk about Jesus as our sacrifice um, at this time. Five, number one, it's a beauty treatment. 
This is interesting. You can read this in Esther chapter 2 where they're talking about the king and for his uh, harem of ladies. In order for one of the ladies to be presented to the king, she had to go under six months of treatment of myrrh before she could even be presented to the king. Six months of myrrh, right? I don't know if she needed all the help or if it was just awesome. I don't know. That's what happened with it. Six months. Amazing, right? It's also used as a perfume in the Bible. That's the second use. You can read this in Proverbs and Song of Psalms. You know, Song of Psalms is this great love letter. It talks about using um, myrrh in, the, in, in various places in the house and on your body. It just smells so great. It's also used in Exodus 30 as an anointing oil. God gives Moses like this recipe for anointing oil that he can anoint the temple and God's people and the throne, all kinds of various things uh, for God's use. Uh, the last two are very most important for us today. It's used as a painkiller. That's number four. And number five is an embalming fluid in the Bible. It's used as a painkiller, like, uh, like inside the body, and an embalming fluid both inside and outside the body. We see both of those with Jesus. Myrrh was given to Jesus at his birth and his death. I don't know if you know that. So in Mark chapter 15, Jesus is on the cross. Remember he says this great line, I thirst, and he's walking to the cross, and this happens a couple times. And, and people know that he's about ready to experience excruciating pain, just serious pain. They've already beaten him. They're going to kill him. And so he's offered this drink. And the Bible says in Luke that it's myrrh mixed with wine together because it would be a bit of a painkiller. And Jesus refused it to remind us that he's going to go fully in with the, the full weight of our pain and of our sin. After he dies, in John 19, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea come and take his body, and they have 75 pounds of spices that they're going to put on the body to help kind of in the decay process, the embalming process, and part of that is myrrh. Easter Sunday morning, that, that happened all so quickly that they just kind of gather what they have. Easter Sunday happens, and there's like three days in between there, and, and Mary and Martha and the ladies have a little more time to prepare. So they go to the store. The Bible says they get the spices correct and they go back to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning where they expect to properly embalm the body and they bring myrrh, incense. So myrrh is all throughout the Bible, specifically when Jesus was born and when he died, comes up. Painkiller and an embalming uh, material. Why give this to baby Jesus? That would be a weird gift to give at a baby shower, don't you think? I wonder if it was weird to Mary. I, I just want, I don't know, I wonder if Mary said, gold, this is great. I mean, we've never even seen gold before. That's fantastic. He's a king. Or frankincense, oh, our, our, king, our baby's going to be a priest. He's going to be something special. That's awesome. And embalming fluid, that's creepy to the third guy. You didn't put a lot of thought into this, right? Nobody, when their baby's born, wants to think about the death of the child. You want to think about their long life and their longevity and how they're going to live and all the great things they're going to do. You're not thinking of, about their death. I wonder. It would be weird. But listen to the lyrics from We Three Kings. I'm not listen. Let me just read them to you here. This is the line. We sang it earlier in the service. And it kind of helps us understand. Myrrh is mine, a bitter perfume. That's the word means bitter. It's a perfume. Breathe a life of gathering gloom. When Mary received that, like there's gloom on the horizon for this baby. There's a struggle coming for this child. Sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. That's the point of myrrh. It was given to prophetically remind us that Jesus was born to die for the sins of the world. Now, I don't know this. The Bible doesn't say this, but I, I wonder because Mary was like in tune with a lot at this time. The Bible says she was highly favored and she recounts the whole story to Luke, who writes it down. I wonder if when she was given that myrrh and she realized this is the thing about death, that she's reminded that when the angel first came to her, he said, you are highly favored and you will give birth to the Messiah and he will save the people from their sins. I wonder what point she connected those dots. We'll find out when we get to heaven and can talk to her. Jesus is called, because of this concept, the suffering servant. The suffering servant. Now think about this. I was thinking about this this week. Uh, talk about this at lunch. When Jesus is given gold, it's because he's a king. And as a king, you'd expect, you'd expect that he would be the one who's being served. Okay? When Jesus is given frankincense, as a priest, you'd expect that he would be honored. Myrrh 
shows us that he's going to be exactly the opposite of those things. He won't be served as a king. He will be the one who serves. And he won't be the one who's honored. He will be the one who suffers. That's the point of myrrh. He's the suffering servant. And this is highly um, prophetic from the book of Isaiah that we read earlier from chapter 53. Chapter 53 was written 700 years before Jesus' birth. 700 years before Jesus was born, before the Magi came, before any of this happens, he gives a very detailed account of what Jesus' life would be as our Savior, as our suffering servant, as a baby that was born to die. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is going to be a little bit more of a, not somber passage to look at, but a very important passage to look at. There's nothing funny in this passage, like we like to have fun around here a lot of times. Nothing funny in this, but something very important to your life, very important to your eternal life. So let's look at it and help it kind of land for us today. All right, he begins this way in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Let's talk about that. So the message is this. Here's what the message is. The message is that there is a Savior. Amen, church? That's the message. There's a Messiah that has been born. Now, he's prophetically speaking about this, but we live in the reality that he has been born, he has come, he's died, he's resurrected. There is a Savior. He is here, okay? Now, then he says this idea about the arm of the Lord. This is only used three times in the Bible. It's, a, it's an obscure thing, but it's pretty easy to understand. The arm of the Lord means his saving reach. That's all that means. The arm of the Lord who reaches down and saves us. Like a lifeguard who sees somebody drowning, they reach down and pull them out of the water. That's, that's the whole concept. Not a complicated concept. That's what it is, okay? So he says the message is there's a Savior, and he wants to save you. He wants to reach out and help you, okay? That's the message. Then he asks two rhetorical questions here, okay? First one, I'm going to take them backwards. He says this, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, Everybody. It's, I mean, the message is largely shared, okay? I know everybody on the planet probably hasn't heard, but you, you get the idea. That everybody's hearing this. The gospel is everywhere. The Bible is in every language, including Russian. That's what we gave to Gorbachev. It's on the internet. It's everywhere. Whom has heard the, about the, the reach of God? Really everybody. I mean, it's really out there. It's really well known. But he has a second rhetorical question first. And who has believed? Not everybody. Not a lot of people, actually, if you compare the two. Everybody can or has heard about the saving knowledge of Jesus, but not everyone has received it. So why? Why is there so much unbelief? Why is it that the message is so awesome? Everything about Jesus is incredibly awesome. There is no downside to it at all, eternally. There's none. So why is it that it's so widely shared, but so few people have received it over the course of history and throughout our world. Why? Well, in the following verses, he's going to tell us a few reasons why that happens. He goes on. He says this. All right. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. Going to be a baby. Grow up, okay? And like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Again, he's being prophetic. We have the advantage of being on this side of the story so we can connect all the dots. He's prophesying that when the Messiah comes, he's not going to look like a Messiah, physically or in any other way. He won't be, you know, he won't be born with a halo around his head, you know, not that weird thing, right? He won't be born in a palace. He'd be born in a manger. That's why the Magi go to the Herod's temple looking for a baby that was born king. He's not there. That's what you'd expect, but he's not that. He's not that. He won't be born to significant people. They have no, I mean, they're significant, but not like, they weren't kings and queens, right? They weren't like two people, like a king from this country and a queen from this country, Mary, and you know, not like that, nothing like that, no significant people. He won't be from a major place. He's going to be from a town, a dumpy town called Nazareth. They got no McDonald's, no Walmart, that's kind of town, right? Even the Bible says, they say, can anything good come from Nazareth? No, he's not from there at all, right? He says, you won't recognize him Physically, because he won't look like a Messiah. He won't come like a Messiah. It won't be like of a kingly heritage or kingly people or born in a suite. He's just not going to look like what you would think. And he won't live like what you would think either. He's not going to live a life of great extravagance. He won't ever even write a book. He won't travel more than 100 miles. He'll never own a home. He'll be homeless. He's going to be poor. He's going to be nothing like you'd expect. He's not going to look like it at all. You will not recognize him by the look, you know? Like we talk about 
somebody who looks presidential, like JFK, okay? JFK, he just looks like a president, right? I mean, just big chin, strong looking, good looking dude. I mean, people, sometimes people look like a president. Queen Elizabeth, I mean, she looked like a queen. I mean, actually, she looks like a queen because she was around for like 70 years as queen, and like she defined what a queen looks like, right? So we have these ideas of what they would look like, but he's saying Jesus won't look like what you expect. There will be some prophecies by which you can recognize him is what he's going to share. And he's going to give some examples. He says this. Here's one thing. He'll be despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Well, that's not what you'd expect by a king. A king is usually welcomed. I mean, not everybody loves the king, but usually they're loved and adored and followed. And, but he's going to be despised and rejected. Despised and rejected. This is how so many people continue to treat Jesus. Isn't it shocking how many people despise Jesus? I mean, there are people who adamantly hate the faith and hate God and attack the faith and attack the church and attack Christians. There are people who are like that. And we could go on and on about why that is, but it's just astonishing that Isaiah was true. There will be people who despise him, even though Jesus loves them, saves them, died for them, but people despise him. Some people don't go that far. They just simply reject him, right? Now, people who despise Jesus are after the faith. They're trying to destroy it, trying to be in conflict with God, trying to beat it down. People who reject faith are often just, they're impartial. They don't love Jesus. They don't hate Jesus. They're like, I don't have anything to do with this. Not Not my battle, not my thing, not my whatever. And some people still do those things. Probably more people in our society will reject people than despise him. But both are certainly true. God sent him to help us eternally and in this life, and we despise and reject them. We would never do this with anybody else that came to help us. If your house was on fire and the fire department came to save you, you wouldn't despise them. You wouldn't reject them. You'd let them right in. One reason that we despise or reject Jesus is because of what we just read in verse 1, that he doesn't look or act like a the Messiah, the king that we want. He didn't. He didn't look or act like that at all in the the story. Like, you know, the Palm Sunday story is the best one where Jesus comes into town and he's on a donkey and they're all waving the palm branches saying, Hosanna, you've come to save us. You're our king. Overthrow the Romans. Overthrow the bad dudes. I mean, make it all new. And by the end of the week, they're yelling, crucify him because he didn't do anything that they wanted him to do. You've had the exact same experience. I've had that exact same experience in which we expect God to do one thing, or we want God to do one thing, and he, and he doesn't do it in his divine providence and sovereignty and his will, and we can reject him for that or despise him for that. As a matter of fact, I think that's why so many people do, in fact, despise or reject Jesus because he hasn't lived up to their expectations. He doesn't look like what they want him to look at. And it says here he's familiar with suffering and pain. Again, you think a king would not be familiar with that. He'd be protected from that, but Jesus is familiar with that. He knows pain. He knows what it's like to be beaten and his beard pulled out, to be spit on, to be betrayed, to be abandoned, disowned, to be poor, to be homeless, to be mocked, to be ridiculed, to be scoffed at. He knows all of that. So when you come to Jesus with any problem in your life, any grief, any struggle, he knows and understands pain. He's familiar with it. Jesus doesn't interact with you in your pain and look at you and go, man, I have no idea what you're talking about can't identify. He doesn't. He can identify with us in every painful way. Have you been hurt? Have you been mistreated, rejected, overlooked, unjustly criticized, misunderstood? Jesus Jesus understands all of it. So when you're hurting, don't run from Jesus. Run to Jesus. He goes on. He says, "He he was like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. All right, let's talk about this hiding. The first people to hide from God were Adam and Eve, right? No story, garden, they sin because they want to be like God. They didn't sin just because they wanted to sin. The root of it was all they ate the apple because they wanted to be like God. And then they felt shame, and they went and hid. Right? And God comes to the garden and says, where are you? Right? So they're hiding. It starts from there. They're hiding because they're attempting to be like God. And we still do that today. People still try to hide from God, try to ignore him, 
They don't attend church, run from him, do anything they can to kind of get out of the reach of his saving arm because they're trying to live life in their own way, trying to be God of their own life, trying to be their own king, right? That's why we hide still today. And that's what it means to hold him in low esteem. He's a king who we should follow, who we should not try to steal the throne from, but instead we try to do that. We say, oh, he's not that big of a deal. He's not that important. We don't want to follow him. He's no king. He's not my leader. He's just a good teacher, but he's not me. So I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to hide from all of his law and his leadership. That's what we do. That's what that passage means. If he is your king, I told you this first week, the most significant thing I can tell you about the gold, that means he's your king, you should obey him. If he's your king, you should obey him in all things, even the things you struggle with or don't understand or maybe even disagree with, because he is the king. That's how you hold him in high esteem. Surely, it goes on, he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Uh, uh, This verse and the next one, you're going to see this our word come up with, our pain, our suffering, our punishment, okay, and see some more. He took our pain and our suffering. This is why when he was on the cross, and they gave him like a, a cup filled with, mixed with wine with myrrh, this is why he rejected it, because he wanted to feel your pain, your suffering, and he knew it was going to be painful physically, but he refused that because he didn't want to go down in history as somebody who said he took a painkiller so he didn't experience your pain. He wanted the full weight of the pain of sin, and so he refused the myrrh when he was on the cross, the full weight of it. He died the death that we were supposed to die, and he took our punishment on the cross. He... Jesus was punished for our sin. That's so important for lots of reasons. But some of you, when you're going through life and you, and you have your own struggle and your own pain and your own suffering, when these pain and suffering comes, because it comes, some of you think, God is punishing me. Never think that. Now, yes, there are consequences for sin. But God doesn't punish you for sin because he's already punished his son for you. Now, he may let consequences happen and grow you in that, but punishment, your punishment was given to God. However, that's really only for those who receive Jesus. For those who reject Jesus, by all means, you will be punished for your sin. It's your choice. And then he goes on and he says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are here. Healed. You've probably heard this verse, pretty famous verse, pretty known verse. He gives these two words here, um, transgressions and iniquity. See those two words there? Those are two words for sin. They both mean sin. You know, you know those sins you've committed? Maybe a long time ago, something you committed. Maybe this morning, something you committed. Maybe the one you're planning to do later. I don't know. Where you're at. You know that sin in your life? That we all got it. For all have sin. You know that sin? Those sins are the reason that Jesus was crushed and pierced. Those are the words. He is crushed. He is pierced because of our sins, our iniquities, our transgression. Interestingly enough, myrrh is a substance that gives off its best scent when crushed. It comes out of a tree in a sap form, and they let it sit there for a while. I'll just get some out here. They let it sit there for a while until it hardens. You know, see, it's like a hard little rock here, right? Okay, whoop, ah. And uh, it, it, it's not really of great use until it's crushed. And the scent comes out, and it's smashed, and it's put into an oil or some other form. Same is true with Jesus. His greatest beauty in his life was when he was crushed and pierced for us. And because of that, you and I get peace. Because he took our sin, our problem, our pain, our suffering, our punishment. Because he took our things, we are healed. That's the point. That's the point. We are healed. Because he was beaten, we can be made whole. Because he was whipped, we can be healed. And that brings us peace with God. That's what the point is. Now, then he goes on to maybe one of the most famous verses in the Old Testament, super famous verse in the Bible. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You've probably heard that many, many times in your life, especially if you go to church. Very famous verse. We are like sheep 
That's not a compliment. It's not a compliment. It would be a compliment if Isaiah said, we are like lions. We are like Lippenzon stallions. We are like eagles. Those would be compliments. But not sheep. Not a compliment. A couple reasons why. Sheep are stupid. You know this, right? I mean, I don't know a lot about sheep, but I've studied a little bit of this, right? This is, you know, what I read, right? You can train all kinds of animals to do stuff. You can train lions, and you can train elephants and fleas. You can even train, for goodness sake, a cat. I mean, just you can train things, right? But you can't train a sheep, right? Do you know how to make a, do you know, do you know how to make a sheep play dead? Shoot them. <laughs> the point is, they can't do a lot, right? Okay, sheep are stupid. And they get lost easily. Even Jesus tells a story about the lost sheep because everybody goes, yeah, we get that story. Anytime you get a group of sheep together, one is wandering off, getting lost, okay? They get lost easy. They're, they're, they t- tend to follow the crowd, right? Sheep are also defenseless. This is why it's not good to be a sheep. Other animals have defense mechanisms. I mean, even a camel can spit, right? Some animals have talons or claws or horns or they can kick, Animals have defense messes, but sheep have nothing. The only thing a sheep can do when confronted is say, back off. That's, a, that's as funny as I can get today. This is not much material here. <laughs> right. Just like us, we're defenseless against the evil one. It's true. We're like sheep. This is why so many people just head into destruction. Sheep are stubborn. They are dirty. They need God to lead them and help them. We are all like sheep, he says, okay, who go astray and turn our own way. This is the essence of rebellion. This is what it means earlier when he says that we despise Jesus and reject him. Instead of going his way, receiving his way, even though he's not what we expected, we just still go his way. We reject him and say, I'm going to turn and go my own way. I don't like what you're saying. I don't like what you're leading. I don't want you to be king. I'm hiding from you. I'm going my own way. That's the essence of of rejecting and despising him. So we turn. We are like sheep. We turn and look for stuff to make us happy. When Jesus doesn't deliver on something that we want him to, sometimes we attempt to find something that does. When Jesus doesn't do something even good in our timing, we try to force it and make it happen. We do that. We are just like sheep going our own way. God's solution to this, God's solution to the fact that we keep going our own way and we keep sinning and causing pain in our life, we keep transgressing and causing suffering, what does God do? He takes all that sin, all your struggle, all your transgressions, and he lays it on Jesus. He laid it on him, and all our sin was put on Jesus. Every sin you've ever committed, the hypocrisy, the greed, the anger, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, every bit of it, anything and everything, or wickedness, all of it. We deserve wrath, but God gives us forgiveness. We deserve what Jesus endured. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Amen? Amen. All right, let's talk. There's more. Okay, here we go. Next. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. This is prophetic about the trial of Jesus, you know, with Pontius Pilate and that sort of thing. It's about his trial and crucifixion. Jesus could have easily defended himself. I mean, even Pilate was like, if you read it, he's like, come on, dude, like, give me something to work with here, because you could get off this so easy. Their, their claims are false. We know their witnesses are making this up. We know this is all wrong. Just speak for yourself. And Jesus never speaks. He could have easily defended himself against all the crazy ideas, because none of them are true. He could have brought witnesses up. I mean, you would do that. If you were Accused of a crime that you did not commit, you would defend yourself. You would get a good lawyer. You would get witnesses. You would work on your alibi. You would get exhibits. I mean, you do everything you can to like stand before a judge and say, I did not do this, and here's all the reasons why. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to fine. Here's my story. You would do that. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't speak. He was silent. Do you know why? Because if he would have spoke, he would have got off. And he didn't want to get off. You ever think about that? When Jesus is standing there silent, it's not because he doesn't have anything to say. It's because he wanted to take your sin and die for you. That's why. He he didn't want to be set free. He wanted to give his life for yours. 
And then it goes on. He says, by arrest and judgment, again, his trial and crucifixion, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? They didn't really come to his help. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. Instead of defending himself, instead of defending himself, he allowed himself to be arrested, judged, and killed. That's what he did for you. Next slide. He goes on. He was assigned a grave within the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. No deceit. Let's start with this. He, he was assigned a grave. This is prophetic, again, about Jesus' death. Remember at the beginning, he said, you're not going to know he's a Messiah by, by, by the way he looks or acts. He's not going to be born to a kingly family, or he's going to be rich. He's going to look totally different. And he gives all these markers so we can determine, like, who the Messiah really is. And one of the ways you'll know is that he's not going to have a grave when he dies. He's going to be assigned a grave and a rich person's grave. Well, we know that comes true. That's a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. When Jesus is dying on the cross, Joseph and Nicodemus, they go to Pilate and say, hey, he, he, he can die in my, my tomb. He can, he, can live in, he can be buried in my tomb because they had zero idea that Jesus was going to die. So they didn't have a grave prepared. They had none of that prepared. They didn't have spices prepared. They had nothing ready. And so Joseph, a rich guy, offers his grave for Jesus to be born, or to die in. And it says he has no violence in him, no deceit. This is why he could have gotten off at the trial, because there's no sin in his life, no crime, nothing, nothing. He lived a sinless life. What sets Christianity apart from every other Christ religion in the world? Christianity is different. This is why I, I don't think Christianity fits in a, like a, a, a class at a college of world religions, because they all are the same in some fashion, and Christianity is completely different. You can argue that in all kinds of ways. It's, it's like you cannot be Christian to see that. These are all, they, one of these things is not like the others. It's exactly that way. The re, one of the reasons, and there's lots of them, one of the reasons that Christianity is different from Islam and Buddhism and New Age and Hinduism and Sikhism and all these other religions, all these fake other religions, I'm going to put it that way, is that in Christianity, it's the bloody death of an innocent victim. That's one thing that sets us apart. That God gave his life for us. What separates us is that God came to us rather than us getting to him by some good work or some prayer. He comes to us. He's, that's what Advent means, coming, arrival. He comes to us and is crushed for us, is pierced for us, is dishonored for us so that we could get to God and have the peace of God. That's one thing that sets us apart. And he is, and only God who has no sin in him, could do that. He goes on. He says this. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. This was God's plan. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, we will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This is a picture of a Messiah who was dead but is now alive. And it's victorious forever. Let me, let me explain it to you. The three things he says is happening here. Number one, he will see his offspring. Okay, see his offspring. They, they, Isaiah didn't understand this, but we, what we know that to mean is that people who he died for will be saved and will be his children forever. And then his days will be prolonged. Simply means he will live forever. He will conquer death. He will conquer the grave. And he will reign forever, ceasing never as we sang earlier, and the will of the Lord will prosper forever. He will rule and reign with the will of God in mind. Jesus will reign and, and God's plan and God's will will rule forever. Evil will not win. He goes on. We're getting there. He says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Again, a prophecy. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. But this is about his resurrection. The light of life. He's going to be put in a stone-cold tomb, but he's coming out of that sucker, right? You'll see the light of life. He will be born anew, or he'll be resurrected. Isaiah 60 has this fascinating verse that I found that it mentions two of the three gifts. It says this. If you, I'll just quote it for you. In Isaiah 60, it says, They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Why doesn't it mention myrrh? Isaiah prophesies again that they will bring gold and frankincense. Did he not know about the myrrh? Here's what theologians think. 
Because of this verse, he leaves out myrrh because he's going to be alive. A living king who's going to live forever and his body would not stay dead. We serve a living, alive Savior. Amen, church? Yeah. And he's satisfied. He says he's satisfied. His work will be complete. That's all. There's nothing else to do to save you. He's done it all, right? And he will justify many. That's a weird phrase. That jumped out at me immediately when I read this. Does that jump out at you? Because it doesn't say he will justify everybody. It will justify all people. It doesn't say that. He will justify many. Here's what that means. Jesus died on the cross for everybody's sins, but he doesn't save you automatically. You have to receive that gift. You have to receive it in your life. And many will. But sadly, not everyone will. Some will reject him. Some will despise him. Some will turn their faces and hide from him. Some will reject him flat out. I hope you're not one of those. I hope you're one of the many who receive what he has done. Know this. No one is saved just by Jesus' death. You're saved if you confess and believe that what he has done is for you. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life into death and was numbered with the transgressors. The transgressors, again, a prophecy about the two criminals that he's going to be hung with next to him on the cross. This is another marker. He says he won't, be, he won't look like a king, but just so you know, when he dies, there are going to be two other guys next to him he's killed with. That's 700 years before it even happens. That's where it is, right? That prophecy. And then he says this idea that he will give Jesus and, and all of us as his offspring, a portion of the spoils, it's, it's a metaphor for the rewards of heaven. It's a metaphor for eternal life, all of those things. And then he says this. This is awesome. Next slide. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I know he's already said this. We call this the great exchange. C.S. Lewis, I think, is the one who coined that. The great exchange that you have sinned, but yet Jesus is perfectly sinless. No deceit in him. You and I are unrighteous. Jesus is completely righteous. Jesus took our sin, our iniquity. God laid it on him. And God took Jesus' righteousness and covered us with it. That's the great exchange. He gets our sin. We get his righteousness. So that, this is very real. When you stand before God, and you will stand before God, God won't look at you. If you've received Jesus, he won't look at you and see your sin. He will look at you and see his son. But that's only for those who don't reject him, don't despise him, but for those who receive him. Instead of collapsing in grief over our sin, he bears our grief. Instead of increasing our sorrow, he takes our sorrow. Instead of avenging our transgressions, he is pierced for them in our place. Instead of crushing us for our iniquities, he is crushed for our iniquity. All the suffering, all the pain, all the judgment that was due us, he takes it all. That's the gospel. Again, in the very first garden, Adam and Eve were substituting themselves for God and we've been doing it ever since. But on the cross, Jesus reverses that and he substitutes himself for you. Awesome. That's the good news of the gospel, the great exchange. And that's kind of the point of these three gifts. When you think about the wise men offering him myrrh, a substance used to embalm the dead, you understand they're foreshadowing what is to come, that Jesus, this baby, is born for, for many reasons, many, many, many reasons, one of them being ultimately to die for us so we would be saved. So let's wrap it up. Back over here with my boxes. We'll wrap it up, this, this series, this moment. So we have these three gifts. Jesus is our king, Jesus is our priest, and Jesus is our savior. I'll remind you what this means. If Jesus is your king, obey him. I mean, this is just the best place to be is following the lead of Jesus and obeying him in your life. Generally, as it says in the word, or specifically as he leads you. Jesus is our priest. That's frankincense. He's the God who goes before us and intercedes with us before the heavenly Father. If that's the truth. Trust him. Trust he knows your best interest and trust he's leading you. And if Jesus is our Savior, that's what myrrh represents, then you should accept him. Obey the king. Trust the priest and receive the Savior. Isn't it good what God has done for us? 
I hope you'll come Christmas Eve and see what we're going to find when we open this fourth gift. It's something God has amazing for all of you. Would you stand out? We're going to sing together a so appropriate song, um, Nothing But the Blood. Not really a Christmas song. It's more of an Easter song. But the point of myrrh is that even though there's a Christmas, Easter's coming. As I think about that message that Pastor Dave just gave and the gift that Christ has given to us, his life, his blood, so that we could be made righteous, so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could have salvation and eternal life. That's some good news. But as he talked about that many would be justified, it puts a burden on my heart that there might be someone in here this morning 
that hasn't given their life to Jesus. Jesus gave us the greatest gift of all, but the only way for us to receive it is to lay down our life to him as well. The same way he gave his life for us, he calls us to give his, our life to him. So this morning, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you wanna be made right and justified and know that you have eternity in heaven with him, I want you to know that we, we have many people who will be down front who would love to pray with you this morning so that you could receive the greatest gift of all. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. In the midst of our sin, our brokenness, our rebellion against you, you still loved us so much that you came to earth, born of a virgin, lying in a manger. You walked among us, lived a sinless, blameless life, and you deserved no punishment at all. And yet you gave your life so that we could receive ours. Jesus, this morning, as we go off into our daily lives, go back to work, get prepared for Christmas morning. Jesus, I just ask that that gift would resonate in our hearts, that we would be reminded that we have a God who loved us so unconditionally that we could have life and life more abundant and that we have a good news message to share, that this Christmas would be more than about gifts, would be more than about white snow on Christmas, but it would be about you, Jesus, and that amazing gift that you gave to us, you, your son. So Jesus, this morning, go before us and help us to share that same love with everyone we encounter this Christmas season. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Merry Christmas.